Well, it's a joy to be with you on this first Lord's Day of 2021. I've entitled today's sermon, Peril at Sea. And today we're going to be looking at Acts 27 in its entirety. Now, some of you have a map in the, in the back of your Bibles of Paul's missionary journeys. And in particular, the journey to Rome that we're going to look at this morning. It's a fairly complicated journey, and I thought to myself, it would be much easier if I had a map this morning. It would take me a lot less time to explain to you exactly where this ship ends up on the island of Malta. So just, just to remind us, Paul is now leaving Caesarea, where he has been in prison for two long years. He's seen both Felix come and go, and now there's Governor Festus. And more recently, we have seen him give his defense, or his apologia, where he preached the gospel to King Agrippa. And then there was his sister Bernice. She was there as well. At the, at the end of chapter 26, King Agrippa had come to this conclusion. He said that this man Paul should have been set free, could have been set free, if he had not appealed to Caesar. Well, now we have the whole of chapter 27 to read. It's a very exciting chapter. It concludes with a shipwreck. But before we do that, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you that your word is a light to our feet and a lamp into our path. Lord, you, you save us through your word. You instruct us. You correct us at times. You give us encouragement and all of your promises. So, Lord, we ask today that the Holy Spirit would come and illuminate our minds, open this passage up to our understanding, and help us to see the truths in your word in such a way that we can't possibly miss it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is God's word. And when it was decided that we, and you notice that the we in this chapter, uh, it will occur 16 times throughout, because Luke is on this ship, and so no wonder we have this detailed account of the storm that's about to take place. And so it says in verse 1, and when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius, and embarking in a ship of a dramatium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put, out, put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon. And Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found the ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Sinaitis. And as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salome. Coasting along... With difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lazia. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, the fast is a reference to Passover, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the, jo the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to Paul, what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there, on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Now when the, the, the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to shore. But soon a tempestuous wind, called the Nor'easter, struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to, to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that they would run aground on Sirtis, they lowered the gear and thus were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. 
when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay on us, we hope that all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, and don't you love this, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found twenty fathoms. A little farther on, they took a sounding again and found fifteen fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for a day to come. And as the soldier, the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under the pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the, the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten, though, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground, the, the bow struck, and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Well, this is the Bible in 3D, isn't it? It's a tremendously detailed and a vivid description because, of course, Luke was there with them in this storm. But we need to go back for a moment to Caesarea and ask ourselves what was going on in the mind of the Apostle Paul as they set sail from Caesarea headed to Rome. During the snail's pace of this ill-fated voyage, surely Paul must have been pondering the strange providence of God particularly in those opening days, and, and then once the storm came, and how once again he was being tested. I mean, he's already spent two years in prison in Caesarea. And now when it looks as, at last as, he is, as if he's bound for the city of Rome, still there are surprises in God's providence. From the moment they boarded the ship to the point at which the ship broke apart off the island of Malta, there was no miracle. Uh, there was no noticeable divine intervention. Uh, there was no voice of the master in the midst of the storm saying, Peace, be still. During the two weeks at sea in this near-death experience, why did God not intervene? Why toss the apostle Paul around like a half-drowned rat at sea? It will be understandable, of course, in the case of Jonah. And we just completed a study in, in, in the evening, Sunday evenings, in the book of Jonah, Pastor Chad just did an amazing job taking us through that book. Best preaching on Jonah I've ever heard. But it, it's understandable in the case of Jonah that God would send a storm to prevent him from going any further away from where God wanted him to be. 
But Paul is not doing what Jonah did here. He's not running away from God's call. He's not trying to go in the wrong direction. He's not walking in disobedience. Paul is obeying God. He's heading in the very direction God wants him to go. Paul is walking in the path of obedience. And yet still he encounters the dark side of God's providence. So don't be surprised, dear friends. Even when you do the right thing, that trials and tribulations and difficulties may come and litter your path. I want to revisit a quote from a couple of weeks ago from William Cooper in the 17th century. He was an English poet and a hymnodist. And he wrote, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea. Yes, in the sea. And he rides upon the storm. Judge not the Lord by feeble strength, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence there hides a smiling face. Deep in unfathomable minds of never-failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Well, throughout this chapter, Paul intervenes four times. So I want us to consider this passage around those four interventions. And the first intervention is in verse 10, which actually takes place off the Isle of Crete in a bay called Fair Havens. Well, first let's remember how Paul got there. Festus and Agrippa have agreed that Paul should have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. He's now placed in the charge of a centurion, a man by the name of Julius, and and he is of the Augustan cohort, the imperial regiment that was stationed in Caesarea. Even though Festus gave the order to have Paul transported to Rome, the fulfillment of that order depended on several factors and a number of people. For instance, the governor would not send a prisoner to Rome, just one prisoner to Rome, accompanied by a centurion and a band of soldiers. He would wait until a group of prisoners from various parts of Palestine and the interior could be sent by ship to Italy. The authorities would have had to wait for a ship that would have been able to accommodate this sizable company, a company that would go. With them on board is a man that we've met before, Aristarchus. You remember he was one of those who came from Thessalonica when Paul made his journey to Jerusalem with the offering of money uh, two years before, just before Paul's arrest. And here's Aristarchus, Paul's friend, And later on, he will end up in prison with Paul in Rome. But at this point, he's not a prisoner. He seems to be included among the we, uh, as Luke is writing in the first person here. Now, it it might be surprising that, that, uh, that Rome, the Roman Empire, had no imperial fleet, you know, to transport soldiers and prisoners. But transportation was rather by means of a large freighter that would sail along the coast to deliver and receive freight and also provide a passage for voyagers. They would use this, these freighters sailing from Syria and Palestine and North Africa from the coast of what we would now call Turkey. And in this instance, the, two sh- the ship well, is a private ship. And so they use this ship that's heading from Caesarea up toward the coast, toward Sidon. And then it will make its way along the top. If you looked at a map now, it would make its way on the leeward side of Cyrus, Cyprus, trying to take advantage of these prevailing westerly winds. We learn that in Sidon, Julius shows kindness to the Apostle Paul, allowing him to go ashore to be with his friends and to minister and to be ministered to. No doubt the guard is present with him. Perhaps at Paul's own request, now even as a prisoner on board, he is ministering to the church at Sidon. He's bringing comfort and exhortation to the church there at Sidon. And then the next day, they set sail, taking advantage of the leeward side of Cyprus, making their way slowly with some difficulty against the prevailing winds at this time toward the port of Myra. And in Lycia, they change ships. Now they have a ship that has come from Alexandria in northern Africa. It's a food supply ship. It's a wheat-bearing ship headed toward Imperial Rome. And the prisoners are now put on this ship, and so they head out from Myra along the part of the peninsula, as you can see, that juts out into the sea. They meet with the prevailing northerly winds, and they're driven south and to the south side of Crete. Now, ancient shipping records tell us that sailing in this part of the Mediterranean after September 14th, well, that was considered to be dangerous. 
And if you tried to sail after November the 10th, it was considered to be impossible. Well, it's about mid-October now. The feast has already passed. And this is a dangerous time to be on the Mediterranean. Paul is a, is a very experienced sailor at this point. He's been on the Mediterranean many times, no doubt, spending days in conversation and likely also in evangelism with captains and pilots of ships. And now Paul gives this warning to stay in fair havens over the winter, perhaps go ashore or to remain with the ship, because any attempt to move from fair havens would be accompanied by many problems and difficulties, and perhaps even the potential loss of the ship and loss of life. It's a risk that is too great for the Apostle Paul. And the advice is to move along the coast of Crete toward the, the port of Phoenix, which was a more convenient and a, an accommodating port where they could winter. Now, isn't it interesting, at least it's interesting to me, that the Apostle Paul is not speaking here from a position of having received divine revelation from God. I mean, this is not a result of, of Paul saying, well, God has told me, and now I'm telling you. Now, this is Paul the seafarer. This is Paul using his experience, his wisdom and reason. He's weighing the evidence. He's looking at the circumstances. He, he knows how treacherous it would be to sail during this time of year, and he considers the risk too great. Well, without risk, you know, Columbus would have never discovered the New World, nor would David Livingston have discovered Central Africa, nor would the Apollo space mission have ever discovered the surface of the moon. We all take risk all the time. When you dabble in your pension portfolio, you're taking risk. When you consider a career change, you take a risk. When you consider moving from one location in the country to another part of the country, you're taking a risk. I mean, let's face it, when you drive on I-95, you're taking a risk. Risk is part of life. We engage in it all the time. And so we weigh the evidence, we weigh the circumstances, and yes, we even weigh the odds to some degree. And for Paul, that is what he's doing here. This is his assessment. This risk is too great. This is a risk that begins to tempt the providence of God. But Paul's warning goes unheeded. His word is not taken. Then point two on your outline, the second intervention comes in verse 21. Well, I love this because, you know, we're taught not to say, I told you so. It kind of sounds like one upmanship of some kind of thing, doesn't it? And Paul says in verse 21, you should have listened to me. We're in a fine mess now, but I told you this would happen. The ship is blown as they try to make their way along the southern part of Crete toward the, the port of Phoenix. The northerly winds catch them on that peninsula at the end of Crete, and the ship is blown. Now, I've never been sailing in my life. Maybe I'm being a little too close-minded, but I just don't really have a desire to, to be honest. We, we have often taken walks along the beach near Port Canaveral, and we go down to the jetty there, and they, we watch the, the, the large ships go out to sea. It's very beautiful to watch, to see this massive vessel leave port. Perhaps some of you are sailors. Uh, you have smaller boats, and some of you sail, and you're really into it in a big way. You understand the mathematics, the physics, the ocean, the topography, navigation, and all that. But this little boat, and all of us can understand this, this little boat is at the mercy of a nor'easter. A nor'easter is like a, kind of like a hurricane. It's, it's a big storm, and the boat is tossed. And so you have to imagine the wind and the rain, thunder and lightning perhaps, and they cannot see the stars, so they cannot navigate. They don't have a fancy little, you know, GPS gadget. They have no idea where they are or which direction they're going. And there comes a point at which they abandon all hope. Here we have experienced sailors, we have an experienced captain, and yet all hope is lost. They're drifting. You notice that Luke describes the manner in which they tie ropes around the ship. Maybe some of them above the water, uh, but more likely around the ship and under the waters. It says that they undergirded the ship to hold it together as, as it's in danger of really just splitting apart. One giant wave, and this boat is done for with seven, 276 souls on board. Verse 15 says, it is being driven along. And by the way, it's the same verb that Peter employs when he says in 2 Peter 1 that no scripture 
comes from private interpretation of men, but men wrote as they were carried along, same word, by the Holy Spirit. And isn't that a powerful verb for how the scriptures came into being? Like this boat at the mercy of the wind, so these authors of scripture are at the mercy of God as as they brought the scriptures into being. Such a powerful image. You notice in verse 24, Paul says, and this time he has a vision. Uh, This time there's a voice. This time he hears these wonderful words. And how many times in scripture does God come to his servants and say, do not be afraid? Those are beautiful words, aren't they? Because every single one of us here this morning can tell of an experience or a set of circumstances where we've been afraid. We were afraid of cancer, afraid for our children growing up in this world, worried about our job and our provision, uh, anxious about a hundred different things. And God comes to Paul. Now, granted, he comes to Paul in a very unique set of circumstances. But what does he say to Paul? What's he saying to Paul when he says, I have told you before what's going to happen? That's, that's, the, that's basically what he says. God's going to keep his word. You notice in verse 24, he says, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. The intent seems to be that God is saying to Paul, I've heard your prayer, Paul, and it's being granted. In the midst of the storm, what's Paul been doing? He's been praying. He's been praying for his passengers. He's praying for the 276 persons who are on board this ship. And God has heard his prayer. Joseph Shriven of the mid to late 19th century, he was an Irish poet. And he wrote the poem which became the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. You remember how it goes. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? You should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And he wrote that poem after he had lost two fiancés. The first one drowned on the eve of their wedding. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? You should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. You know, prayer is one of the great encouragements we have in the Christian life. And especially on Sunday evenings as we gather in corporate prayer time. Because prayer brings what? Well, it brings encouragement. It brings strength. It bolsters our faith. It brings hope. It brings assurance. It reminds us of the absolute certainty that we have in God's promises. That all of his promises are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, the third intervention, you read of it in verse 31, because now they're, they are adrift. They, they drift for 14 days, very long time. The text says on the 14th day, you know, Josephus, the, the Jewish historian, was, was on board a ship in that part of the Mediterranean one time. He was caught in a storm, and of the 600 souls that were on board the ship, only 60, including himself, made it safely to shore. There's an, there's an attempt now, though, as they hear the sound of the surf and the shore. Um, they have no idea because they can't see it. They have no idea where they are. It's still nighttime. For all they know, it's just rocks nearby. So they drop four anchors, and there's an attempt. And the soldiers uh, try to take this little boat that they have. It's probably what we would call a dinghy. And they try to escape. He says to the captain, and this time the captain listens, He says, if these soldiers escape, there's no possibility of this ship making it to land. We need all of these men. And then in the amazing part of the narrative, and this is the fourth intervention by Paul, because in the calm of the storm, as apparently the storm begins to subside, Paul urges them to eat. Now, can you imagine that? I mean, this is is a terrible experience that they've been through. Eating is probably the last thing that you would want to do. Many of them were probably seasoned sailors, but apparently these men had, hadn't eaten for a number of days. You know, faith is really practical. I mean, you understand that, right? Just like God comes to Elijah in 1 Kings 17, and he miraculously feeds him along with the widow of Zarephath and her son. He, he, he sustains them through this miracle of causing her little bit of flour and oil to last and to sustain them. 
Then in 1 Kings 19, you remember when Elijah's downcast and God sends an angel and he brings him food and, and he says, eat? It doesn't appear to be st- terribly spiritual, does it? You know, most of the time it's not 40 days of this or that or the other. It's just food and sleep. You know, sometimes you don't need to go to seminary. I mean, you, you don't need to try to figure out what's, what God is doing because you can't figure it out anyway. I mean, you have to keep the right perspective, you know. It's just Tuesday. It's just Wednesday. It's just another day. You need the very basics. You need food. You need to eat. You need to sleep. And he says to these men, come eat now, because tomorrow is going to be a trying day as they try to make it to land. Isn't that beautiful? And I don't, and I don't think this is the Lord's Supper in verse 35. But you can't help but hear the overtones of it. It says, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. I can't help but think that Luke is giving us some signal here of something he's already written in, in, Luke's, in his gospel. At the very least, it's a reminder that everything we have, including a piece of bread, we have that from our gracious Lord. They're in this storm. They could have drowned at sea. You know, the thought of drowning is a horrible thought, isn't it? I mean, nobody likes to think about that. And here they are breaking bread. And there's a reminder that even this piece of bread is from God, and we give thanks to him for it. There's a great lesson in that, because our very lives, everything about us, the reality is that we live under the canopy of and in the embrace of God's good providence to his children. And now in the narrative... It's every man for himself. And some who can swim, well, they have a good chance of making it to shore. Others, perhaps, are trying to find the biggest plank of wood they could find so they could hang on and they won't drown. And yet every single one of them was saved. You know, I can't help but think of it as I close this morning. I can't help but think of that extraordinary story of John Newton in the ship, the Greyhound, on March 10th, 1748. He was caught in a similar storm. He's down in the hole of the boat. There's this tremendous bang as waves are, are crashing on the ship. Um, and and as he's, he's making his way up, the captain sends him down again to get something. And he passes someone on the ladder. And as he emerges back on top, Newton sees him, and a wave comes, and he strikes the man, and he, he's gone. He died. Newton tells how all through the night they try to bail water out of this ship and how they're using anything and everything they can to try to plug the gap in the broken vessel clothes bedding anything they can find and all of a sudden he cries out to the Lord at that point the first time he had done so in his entire life you know you could call Newton a blasphemer up to that point he had a a vile mouth for the first time in the midst of the storm he cries out to God and that was the beginning of amazing grace How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. He encountered the living God. And that seems like what these men experience. I mean, Luke was overwhelmed as they lay on the beach there in Malta, giving thanks to God for his extraordinary gift, this incomprehensible providence. So this morning, brothers and sisters, regardless of what you're facing, God has promised to never leave us or forsake us. He only does what's good and right and best in all of our lives. And he loves us with a permanent, um, unconditional love because we rest in his son, Jesus Christ. And he's promised to get us home safely to heaven one day. Father, thank you so much for your word. We ask now that you will hide it into our hearts, press it so deeply into our minds uh, that we can't possibly miss your truths that you have for us here. And so, Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.